Hi, and good morning from Saudi United Methodist Church on this, the fourth Sunday in the season of Lent, March the 14th, 2021. I pray that the Spirit of Christ will grant you peace and comfort and new insight as we share in his word together. May the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon you. Today is the fourth message in our Lenten sermon series entitled Empire's End. We have been exploring a few different points in the life of Jesus where he confronted and challenged the empires of his day, empires that kept people oppressed and broken and hopeless. And as followers of Jesus, we are also called to confront and work to overcome the empires of our day that keep people in bondage. So far, we have seen Jesus confront the empires of Satan and death. He won victory over Satan on the cross by disarming him and making him vulnerable. And he won the victory over death by conquering the grave, not only through his own resurrection, but through the raising of the widow's son, as we talked about last week, and the raising of Lazarus in John chapter 11. Now, we might be tempted to think that since Jesus had already hogtied the two biggest empires, evil and death, that there would not be a lot left for him to do. But that was not the case. Turn with me to our scripture reading today, Luke 13, verses 22 through 30. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 22 through 30. And I will be using the message translation. He went on teaching from town to village, village to town, but keeping on a steady course toward Jerusalem. A bystander said, Master, will only a few be saved? He said, Whether few or many is none of your business. Put your mind on your life with God. The way to life, to God, is vigorous and requires your total attention. A lot of you are going to assume that you'll sit down to God's salvation banquet just because you've been hanging around the neighborhood all your lives. Well, one day you're going to be banging on the door, wanting to get in, but you'll find the door locked and the master saying, Sorry, you're not on my guest list. You'll protest, but we've known you all our lives. Only to be interrupted with his abrupt, your kind of knowing, can hardly be called knowing. You don't know the first thing about me. That's when you'll find yourselves out in the cold, strangers to grace. You'll watch Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets march into God's kingdom. You'll watch outsiders stream in from east, west, north, and south, and sit down at the table of God's kingdom. And all the time, you'll be outside, looking in, and wondering what happened. This is the great reversal. The last in line put at the head of the line, and the so-called first ending up last. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Someone near Jesus raised an honest theological question. Master, will only a few be saved? In that day and time, many scholars and rabbis discussed the idea of salvation, specifically who would be saved and who wouldn't. Much of their understanding revolved around the image of the great banquet, which is pictured in Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. Listen to this. 
In Jerusalem, the Lord of heaven's armies will spread a wonderful feast for all the people of the world. It will be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged wine and choice meat. There he will remove the cloud of gloom, the shadow of death that hangs over the earth. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He will remove forever all insults and mockery against his land and people. The Lord has spoken. In that day, the people will proclaim, This is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings. Now, one perspective on the great banquet at that time was that the meal would be open to everyone, but with judgment against those who had harmed Israel. Another perspective taught that the Gentiles would be excluded as well as any blemished Jews. Still others said that all of the children of Abraham would feast at this grand meal. But as sin continued to grow and corrupt Israel, the people became arrogant in their chosen status. They misconstrued God's blessings as something that they were owed or that they were entitled to rather than the priceless gift of grace that it was. So Jesus had to confront the empire of religious exclusivity or religious exclusivism. Let's take a look at how he challenged his people's sense of religious entitlement. To begin with, we want to say that Jesus put the focus of salvation squarely on the here and now. He said, whether few or many is none of your business. Put your mind on your life with God. The way to life, to God, is vigorous and requires your total attention. You know, sometimes we as Christians can get so wrapped up in theological speculation about heaven or the end times or this or that, that we miss the purpose of life in Christ now. We have not been called, saved, and sanctified just so that we can sit back in our pews and wait for glory. We are to be equipped and we are to be sent out into the world as missionaries. Getting saved means that we start growing and maturing and serving. We invest our lives to reach other people and to make the world a better place. So Jesus told the person who raised this question, and by extension he was telling the crowd and his disciples at the same time, that life with God in the hereafter is directly related to identifying fully and personally with the redemptive goals of God here in the present. You know, the United Methodist Church does not have a specific doctrine regarding things like the end times, the millennium, or the rapture. You can believe whatever you like about those things. Our denominational focus and our theological focus is on making disciples for the transformation of the world in the here and now, not pontificating about what might or might not happen in the future. Our founder, John Wesley, was very much focused along the same lines. He did not spend a lot of time dreaming about and arguing about the end times, or or a lot of things like that. Wesley's focus was on making disciples and living holy lives now. So the first thing that Jesus wanted people to recognize was, was that salvation was not just future tense, but more importantly, it was present tense. The second thing 
that Jesus pointed out was that salvation was not earned or based on merit. He told the people, a lot of you are going to assume that you'll sit down to God's salvation banquet just because you've been hanging around the neighborhood all your lives. Well, one day you're going to be banging on the door wanting to get in, but you'll find the door locked and the master saying, sorry, you're not on my guest list. And you'll protest, but we've known you all our lives. Only to be interrupted with his abrupt, your kind of knowing can hardly be called knowing. You don't know the first thing about me. Now, as we said a moment ago, the people of Israel thought of themselves as special, as exclusive. They were God's elect and as a result, they ended up sleepwalking through their religious rituals and obligations. Because, hey, you know, if you're God's favorite, then you don't really have to show up and do very much, do you? Over the centuries, their identity as God's chosen nation had caused them to become complacent, arrogant, and selfish. A lot of you are going to assume that you'll sit down to God's salvation banquet just because you've been hanging around the neighborhood all your lives. In other words, what Jesus was saying was that you think that just because you are a Jew, that automatically qualifies you for a special spot in the afterlife. Frighteningly, Jesus told them, well, one day you're going to be banging on the door wanting to get in. But you'll find the door locked. And the master saying, sorry, you're not on my guest list. Say, like, what? How could God's favored people not be on the guest list? You'll protest. But we've known you all our lives only to be interrupted with his abrupt. Your kind of knowing can hardly be called knowing. You don't know the first thing about me. Yikes. Even though they had done all of the proper religious rituals and they could quote the Hebrew scriptures by heart, a lot of the Jews of Jesus' day did not really know God. Like many Christians today, they knew a lot about God, but they didn't really know God. Churches today are filled with believers who know a lot about Jesus, but they don't really seem to know Jesus. They can attend Sunday school and worship. They can sing most of the hymns by heart. They can quote scripture and yet their lives show no evidence, no fruit, that they actually follow Jesus. Now, some may wrongly assume that their church membership is enough to satisfy God and get them into heaven. I have been a member of such and such United Methodist Church for 40 years. Of course I'm going to heaven. And yet their lives reveal selfishness or judgment, or apathy, or control. Others might rely on their family name or their heritage. Why, my great-great-grandfather put up the mailbox when this church was first built. Of, of course I've, I've got a space in the afterlife. And yet there is no evidence that the person is truly seeking to live in obedience to the call of Christ. The people around Jesus relied on their status as Jews to claim salvation. Even though God had repeatedly told them in the Hebrew scriptures that he wanted justice and obedience rather than robotic ritual performance. Jesus said that's when you'll find yourselves out in the cold, strangers to grace. You'll watch Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets march into God's kingdom. 
You'll watch outsiders stream in from east, west, north, and south and sit down at the table of God's kingdom. And all the time, you'll be on the outside looking in and wondering what happened. Because Israel had become an exclusive little club. And in their thinking, God belonged to them alone. They had forgotten the main purpose of their calling, which was to draw other nations to the Lord. The church often falls into that very same trap. We get secure in our worship style or in our building, in our weekly routine and going to Sunday school or worship. And we can forget about those that we are called to reach. No church exists for the benefit of its members. It exists to reach those who do not yet know the saving grace and the life-transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Many people still don't fully understand or know the healing, freeing gift of God's grace. Many of those are outside the walls of our church buildings. Others may not fully understand or know the healing, freeing gift of God's grace and are inside the walls of our church buildings. It's possible to be so close to salvation and yet so far away at the same time. That is something that we are going to look at next Sunday as we continue to look at how Jesus confronted and overcame the empires of this world that kept people in bondage. I hope that you will be able to join me next Sunday as we take a look at a, a, a message that I have entitled, I just forgot the title, <laughs> uh, a message uh, titled, um, So Close Yet So Far Away. Sorry about that. The, the old brain is, is going. <laughs> But for now, would you pause with me and in these holy moments, let us go before the Lord in prayer. Father of our lives, in humility and awe, we bow before you. We've heard this morning about Israel's religious exclusiveness, of how they thought themselves so great and privileged because they had been chosen by you. We too may be guilty of thinking that our salvation is an entitlement you owe us or something we've earned by our own merits or achievements. If this describes our heart, we pause now to ask for forgiveness. There may be ways in which we have become like Israel of old. We may assume that the church exists to serve our needs and to make us happy. We may have forgotten the stranger, the lost, and the hurting outside our doors. If this describes our heart, we pause now to pray specifically for those we know who still choose to stand outside your grace. We also pray that more people would be drawn to Christ, that more people would accept him into their hearts and lives, that more people would be drawn to this church community here at Saudi United Methodist Church, as well as to the church communities of those who are watching this video. And we pause to ask you one final question, Lord. How can you use me to make these things happen? In submission to and with love for Jesus, our Redeemer, we pray. Amen. Thank you again for joining me here this morning. 
for this fourth Sunday in Advent. I pray that the rest of your day goes well, that you stay healthy and happy. Uh, if you have been uh, able to get your COVID vaccine, I hope that you have done that. If you're waiting to get yours, great. I haven't been able to get mine quite yet. I'm still not in that qualifying uh, uh, um, set of, of requirements. But as soon as it's available, I will, uh, I will go and take that. So stay safe, stay healthy, stay in touch with the Lord. And will you receive this blessing and benediction? Sovereign Lord, we have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Depart in peace to reveal Jesus Christ to the world. Amen.